Most especially, I would like to thank my colleague, Jessica Sweeney, who launched this whole event. I will now turn things over to her to introduce the event and our distinguished speakers, as well as to introduce Collegium's new Ars Vivendi initiative on faith, beauty, and the good life, for which she is the managing director and to which series this event belongs. So Jess, over to you. Thanks, Dan. Um, I just wanted to reiterate Dan's welcome to all of you. We're so excited to have you with us tonight um, for this great conversation. When my husband and I first had the spark of an idea for this event sitting in our living room uh, under quarantine, we never imagined that there would be almost a thousand people registered. As Dan mentioned, I'm the managing director of our new Ars Vivendi Arts Initiative. The Ars Vivendi Arts Initiative explores the relationship between beauty, faith, and the arts, probing their importance to human culture and to a life well lived. It seeks to integrate artistic craft with an understanding of aesthetics and an appreciation for the intellectual life behind the creative mind. The centerpiece of this initiative is our new partnership with Dappled Things, a quarterly magazine of ideas, art, and faith founded by Penn alumni. And the hope is to develop this initiative to include fellowship opportunities, cultural productions and artist workshops, seminars, and more special events like the one you're all here for tonight. Before we turn to tonight's event and introduce our panelists, I first want to give the floor to Katie Carl, Editor-in-Chief of Dappled Things. Thank you, Jess. Uh, Dappled Things is a Catholic literary magazine of ideas, art, and faith. We're delighted to be celebrating our 15th anniversary this year and to be under, newly under the umbrella of the Collegium Institute as part of the Ars Vivendi Initiative, which Jess just described to you. Uh, to give you a sense of what we're about, um, I want to share a few of the magazine's recent covers. Um, you can see that we're interested in the distinctively Catholic contribution to culture with its roots in divine worship and its branches everywhere in the world. And since you are here tonight, I imagine that you're probably interested in this too. So for those of you who may want to become new subscribers to the magazine, um, I have a coupon code for tonight offering a special discount for you. Um, there will be an email sent out to all attendees um, that with the information for this. The code is Flannery25. It can be used toward any of our subscriptions and it's valid through June. The best part of this is that Collegium is graciously covering 25% off the cost of subscribing for anyone who's here tonight for the event when you use this code. So I encourage you to hang on to that and consider becoming a subscriber. And Jess, did we get those pictures or did they show up? Um, were you it able to see? It doesn't look like they did, Katie. Okay, let me give that one more shot here. Sure. There we go. All right, great. Here we are. So everyone can see these covers. So that's a year's worth of issues. It's a, it's a quarterly publication, so four issues a year. Um, and with that, I'll turn it back over to Jess to get us started for tonight. Awesome. Thanks so much, Katie. Um, and now to turn to tonight's event and our speakers um, and sort of introduce this event itself. So for a few years, um, I taught a 12th grade humanities course, and when I would sit to prepare my plans for the seminar with my, for my students, um, I would often lament the fact that Andrew Wyeth never illustrated Flannery O'Connor's work. Um, I'm going to actually show you a few of his paintings as I, as I keep talking here. Um, so here. Sorry, one second. There we go. A little couple technical difficulties. My bad. Um, let's see here. There we go. Um, so you can see these beautiful images here um, by Andrew Wyeth. So I, 
the reason I wish that um, Andrew Wyeth could have painted and illustrated her stories um, was because Flannery O'Connor's work, much like Andrew Wyeth's paintings, really pierced reality and opened it up to show it to us. Their gift of storytelling, both visual and written, have the power to pull us in and then to reveal and to horrify us, but also to burst open what it means to live and to move in this world. Their worlds are filled with broken people, sinners, sometimes a glimmer of a saint, the ill, the deformed in body and spirit. The characters, the details, and the stories bring us into a world that is both ours, but also other. They can shock us with the grotesque, but also fill us with a silent wonder or bring us to an encounter with the divine. Tonight, we are joined by four panelists to explore the boldness, honesty, humor, oddity, and power of Flannery O'Connor as a storyteller, as a believer, and as a woman. We will hear from our four panelists, and each will share a few minutes of opening remarks. Um, I'll then open things up for a conversation amongst the panelists, and then we'll conclude with, a, with time for Q&A with all of you in the audience. For the Q&A, you'll be actually be able to send in your questions throughout the whole evening, um, and we'll start answering them in that last portion of the Q&A, um, in that Q&A section that's at the bottom of your screen. So before we get started, I'd like to welcome and introduce our speakers. Firstly, Amy Alsnauer. Amy's writing has won the Annie Dillard Award for Creative Nonfiction and the Christopher Award. Amy is the writer in residence at St. Gregory the Great and a lecturer in mathematics at Northwestern University. Her recent work on O'Connor has been centered on the realm of childhood. Not only did she, not only because of the work that she did for her forthcoming picture book called The Strange Birds of Flannery O'Connor coming out on June 15th from Enchanted Lion Books, but because of the work she's doing to curate an, ex an exhibition on Flannery's juvenilia with Emory University and also her editorial work to bring one of O'Connor's own childhood books, Mistaken Identity, to publication. We'll also be joined by Christine Flanagan. Christine is professor of English at the University of the Sciences and has presented several lectures related to her research about Flannery O'Connor and Caroline Gordon, about which she wrote her most recent book on their letters, The Letters of Flannery O'Connor and Caroline Gordon. This correspondence showcases the little known friendship between Flannery O'Connor and novelist Caroline Gordon, who critiques not only fostered O'Connor's career, but occasioned a series of letters full of insights about the craft of writing. Her teaching and scholarship reflects her varied interests and activities, writing fiction, nonfiction and drama, scholarship on the short stories of Flannery O'Connor and research on experiential learning and creativity. We're also joined by Jen Frey. Jen is a professor of philosophy at the University of South Carolina. Her research lies at the intersection of philosophy of action, ethics, and metaethics, as well as the history of ethics, especially medieval and early modern. She co-edited a book titled Self-Transcendence and Virtue, Perspectives from Philosophy, Psychology, and Theology. The philosophers who have most positively influenced her own work are the three A's, as she calls them, Aristotle, Aquinas, and Anscombe. She's also the host of a popular philosophy and literature podcast called Sacred and Profane Love. And last but not least, we're also going to be joined tonight by Jessica Houghton Wilson. Jessica is the Louise Cohen Scholar in Residence at the University of Dallas in their Humanities and Classical Education graduate program for this upcoming 2020-2021 academic year. She is the author of three books, Giving the Devil His Due, Flannery O'Connor and the Brothers Karamazov, which received um, an award in 2018, Walker Percy, Pyotr Dostoevsky, and The Search for Influence, and thirdly, Reading Walker Percy's Novels. Lastly, and most excitedly, I think, she's currently preparing Flannery O'Connor's unfinished novel, Why Do the Heathen Rage, for publication. So without further ado, uh, I'll pass things over to Amy as we begin this evening's conversation on Flannery O'Connor. Thank you so much, Jessica, in particular to you, but also to everybody that made this evening possible. Um, so as Jess said, my recent work has focused on the realm of childhood. Um, so instead of talking about the solitude that was brought on by um, O'Connor's illness, I wanna focus on a more fundamental or original form of solitude. And that is the solitude of her childhood. 
So Annie Dillard once referred to the ring of silence you hear in your skull when you're little and notice you're living. The ring which resumes later in life when you're sick. So when Flannery became sick, that ring no doubt resumed for her. But again, I want to think about that earlier ring that almost seems to come with childhood and open up for us a permanent interior realm of solitude, a place that we can re-inhabit and necessarily have to re-inhabit at various times throughout our life. But because that, um, that, that experience of solitude is really an experience of mystery. I want to begin by trying to get at that um, sort of imaginatively rather than with an articulation. So I'm gonna share my screen with you. Um, and I'm hoping you're seeing me full image on my screen, I'm very tiny. So I'm hoping you're seeing this full image. Um, so I'm just switching over to my slides. All right. So I'm going to be sharing images both from um, Ping Zhu, the illustrator for my book, but also of Flannery O'Connor's own childhood images. These are drawn from the Flannery O'Connor archives um, at Emory University. And actually, there's one from GCSU. So I want you to just pay attention to the dimensions in all of the images I'm going to show you. They, things don't appear necessarily as they are, but as they might appear from some interior childhood um, vision. So from the beginning, Flannery's floor was littered with ideas. Birds, children, images of flight. What did she see as she sailed above the world and dreamed? All sorts of odd things. And she laughed like the farmer in the field. And I don't know if you can see it, it's really light, but the sun is laughing too. And I just love this image, this existential solitary moment of amusement. Like the farmer in the field, like the April fool. The world she thought was delightful and strange. And that was actually something she scrawled in the margin of a notebook, delightful and strange. And in just a few years when her father dies, she will add another pairing to that. She will talk about grief, how grief and wonder has come upon them. So already in childhood, we have these paradoxical pairings that will mark her fiction, delight and wonder, grief, um, delight and strangeness, grief and wonder. But now I'm gonna move into showing you some images of Flannery as a little girl, um, while I actually do try to articulate what it is about childhood that creates that solitude. So the first thing is that a child doesn't yet count, not in her own estimation at least. She is outside the adult world where everything appears to be happening. And secondly, and more importantly, I think, a child is not yet capable of expressing their experience of the world, or at least not expressing it in full or very often. So even when she is around other people, she is still alone. And I think you can just see, especially in this image, that infinity of experience practically burning in her eyes. So I'm gonna switch back over now to me. Um, so, so we talked a little bit about her imagine this imaginative experience of of solitude, and then um, and then I tried to articulate why that might come to pass. But now I want to get into what O'Connor actually said about childhood. So um, she said multiple times that all the experience you need as a writer you gain in childhood if you manage to survive your childhood. She adds. Um, but it wasn't just that you needed a certain amount of experience and you ha happened to rack up enough of it in childhood. There were really three aspects of childhood that drew her two children as figures for her fiction. So the first is that children tend to be literal. And I love what she says here. A good story is literal in the same sense that a child's drawing is literal. And I hope you can think back to some of those images from the slides. When a child draws, he doesn't intend to distort but to set down exactly what he sees. 
And as his gaze is direct, he sees the lines that create motion, which eventually for her will become the lines of spiritual motion. So she's um, very much drawing on this childhood experience in the way she crafts her fiction. Secondly, she believes that agony is given to children in strange ways. And she says that agony is the only thing we have to carry with us into death. And so we have this literal gaze. We have this special relationship to agony. And finally, in children, as in the poor, Flannery O'Connor thinks we can see ourselves as God sees us. So in actual children, we have this intensified symbolic version of what we all are. So in the last couple minutes here, I want to touch very briefly on three of her stories. Children are all throughout her fiction, but these three stories she wrote in the same one to two year period. So they have sort of a similar quality to them. And that's the river, a circle in the fire and the temple of the Holy Ghost. So in all three of these stories, she carves out this set apart, solitary existence for the child character, first by how she names them. So she doesn't give them a proper name, as you would most people. She gives them this common noun name. So she refers to all three of them as the child. And the only exception is in the river, where eventually he becomes Bevel, but Bevel isn't even his name. So these children remain outside the named adult world. And secondly, and more profoundly, in all three of these, the child is the sensing, perceiving center of the story, while remaining largely on the periphery of the action. So in the river, the littlest boy, only four or five years old, is the hands and feet of the story. In A Circle in the Fire, the girl is the eyes of the story. We run from window to window. We hang over banisters to see the action that is largely beyond her. And then in The Temple of the Holy Ghost, the girl is the mind or the interpretive center of the story. But in all three within this set apart perceiving center is a child whose literal gaze is explicitly involved in bringing about the final action and the moment of revelation. So I want to close with something that um, O'Connor said about art that I think draws on a lot of these strands. She said that art is not anything that goes on among people. It is something that one experiences alone and for the purpose of realizing in a fresh way through the senses, the mystery of existence. And from everything else I've said here, um, I have to believe that that alone vision that she had in her fiction very much was continuous with that vision she was given through her childhood. So thank you so much. I'll be back for the Q&A, but right now I'd like to turn it over to um, Jennifer Frey. Okay, hey everyone. Uh, thanks for uh, I just want to say thanks to Clayium for having me and thanks to everybody for joining us tonight. So I'm just going to say a few brief remarks about the influence of Aquinas, St. Thomas Aquinas, on the fiction and the thought of Flannery O'Connor. And I'm going to focus in particular on what I call her vision of grace. So the first point that I want to make is that I think Flannery O'Connor is a Christian realist, and this is key to understanding her fiction. But I also think that her fiction, her realism is aimed at understanding the deep and abiding mysteries of human life. So I think um, just in terms of her autobiography, Flannery had a sense of mystery from an early age, and this sense of mystery was deepened by the tragic death of her father when she was 12 years old. Um, she once wrote about that time in her life that the reality of death had come upon her and a consciousness of the power of God had broken her complacency like a bullet in the side. So she had this insight that God's grace can be violent and disruptive, that it can shock someone out of their complacency and their comfort with their lives. And I think this is really one of the enduring themes of her fiction. Um, that is the idea that pain, suffering, and grief, um, they can be traumatizing and difficult, but they can also fill us with wonder and awe for the grace and the mercy of God and for the power of God's grace to make a change in us 
even if this process of change is very painful. Because of the shocking violence and the grotesque characters that animate her fiction, she was once described by a famous critic as a hillbilly nihilist, but she protested that she was in fact a hillbilly Thomist. Now we know that Flannery had the habit of reading the 700 page modern library introduction to St. Thomas before bed every evening religiously. And she claimed that she read a lot of theology because it made her writing bolder. She insisted that she wrote happy stories, which centered on the work of grace upon and in us, and which were thick with the promise of God's mercy and redemption. Now, according to Aquinas's vision of man, which she had obviously absorbed into her own thought and made its way into her fiction, we are created in the image of God and naturally ordained to our own perfection or happiness. But our work during our pilgrimage here on earth is to freely cooperate with God's grace so that we can attain our supernatural and beatifying end because we cannot reach it ourselves. So we can attain, so just kind of under our own steam, we can attain a kind of earthly or natural happiness, but this is imperfect. So when we talk about our perfect happiness, we're talking about um, the beatific vision, which we cannot get by ourselves without God's grace. Now, I want to say that she also takes from Aquinas her realism. And I think that she agrees with Aquinas that what the human being is fundamentally is a creature that naturally desires to know and to love reality or the truth and to seek to conform oneself to it so that one can enjoy loving communion with the good and to take one's delight in what is beautiful. The true, the good, and the beautiful are for St. Thomas just different ways a person can be related to being or reality. And of course, God is the ultimate reality. His essence is his being, which means that God is truth, beauty, and goodness itself. Reality includes both God's creation as communicative of and order to his own goodness, and also God's activity in sustaining his creation in being and working to bring it back to himself. This is the work of grace. The Christian must never try to hide from reality, but this is often very painful for us. Reality can be a bit of a tough master. And O'Connor sees very clearly the ever-present temptation in us to resist, to resist, ignore, or distract ourselves from reality, to see it as an obstacle to our perfection rather than the path to it. And it's central to her vision of grace, that grace works to pierce the veil of perception, to help us to see the world and ourselves as they really are, to force us, often comically, <laughs> uh, to confront reality, most especially the unpleasant reality of the effects of sin in our own souls. She was always irritated by people who would imply that writing fiction is an escape from reality. Rather, she had written, it's a plunge into reality, and it's very shocking to the system. Now, Flannery also thinks that the novelist, unlike the theologian or the philosopher, is able to penetrate and reveal the mysteries of our faith in a very unique way through a specifically uh, literary artistic vision. And she once complained that we in the church have overemphasized the abstract and consequently impoverished our imagination and our capacity for prophetic insight. So she wants to carve a special role um, for literature, um, but a literature that I, that I think is very deeply informed by theology, but it cannot be reduced to it. I also think that for O'Connor, vision is a kind of metaphor for the artist. For O'Connor, as for Aquinas, all knowledge begins with the senses, but what we see has a profoundly spiritual dimension to it. For O'Connor, morality for an artist lies in her vision, and she believes that for a successful writer, moral judgment must coincide with dramatic judgment. The two are inseparable in the very act of seeing. In her conception of vision, which again is a metaphor for the artist, O'Connor draws deeply again on Aquinas. 
For O'Connor, as for Aquinas, all knowledge begins with the senses, but what we see has a deeply spiritual dimension. And I think part of this uh, comes about in how she's thinking about prudence. So if we think about Aquinas on prudence, um, you have this idea that prudence is practical wisdom. Practical wisdom is being able to see what to do in particular circumstances, right? So uh, the particular circumstances in your life are unique and unrepeatable. There are no general rules uh, for what to do in specific situations. And what it means to have practical wisdom is just to see what is called for and to be able to translate that into virtuous action. Now, in order to have practical reason, you have to have a good imagination and memory for Aquinas. So you have to have these kinds of interior senses. Um, but most fundamentally, you have to have uh, well-ordered appetites. So you have to have uh, what Aquinas calls moral virtue. Um, so you have to want the right things and the right ends. And you have to have this in order to have correct judgment. Um, and I think this is really important because Aquinas thinks that if we lack correct appetites, um, then we have uh, a certain kind of blindness. Our vision narrows. We're only able, so if we, if we have disordered desires, we're only able to see reality in relation to ourselves. And we're blind to the way that it really is. And we also don't really know where to direct our attention. So, I think the problem of vision, of what we can see and what we cannot see, even when it's right in front of our nose, and the importance of seeing the world clearly and acting in accordance with what we can see, this is also really deeply the influence of Aquinas on her fiction. And I think that um, throughout her fiction, we have this emphasis on the eyes. Um, and this is almost always where she is talking about how grace can transform our vision. Um, okay, so now I am going to disappear and turn it to the next person. Thank you, Jennifer. And thank you, Amy. And thank you, Jessica and all the organizers. Katie, Dan, appreciate it so much. Um, I can't help but um, before I start, um, I can't help but think about um, what's happening in um, towns and cities across the country. And so as my friends and I make reading suggestions to one another, I would, uh, I would throw my recommendation uh, to you, which is um, if you want to read and expand your ideas about race and literature, Toni Morrison's Playing in the Dark, Whiteness and the Literary Imagination is a book that really changed how I saw American literature. Um, and it expanded me in ways that um, I, would, I would want for you to share. So that's um, my moment of uh, thinking about that. Uh, I'm Christine Flanagan. I'm a professor of English at University of the Sciences. And I recently edited a book, as um, Jess said, The Letters of Flannery O'Connor and Carolyn Gordon, which uh, features 13 years of their letters. Um, Carolyn Gordon was Flannery O'Connor's writing mentor for 13 years, they exchanged letters, and um, their correspondence documents how O'Connor grows and develops as a writer and how she transmits elements of her faith through her fiction. And one particular way we can understand O'Connor's work is through looking at what I call her ecological imagination. Uh, you might call this ecological imagination setting. Um, if you take that definition to mean the layers of history and social forces around characters that we see in their buildings, their inventions, their agriculture, in their efforts to control and tame nature. Uh, when I talk about O'Connor's ecological imagination, I look at her use of landscapes, images of nature, um, animals, all ways that she telegraphs those layers of history and social forces. And this um, is what makes O'Connor really a writer worth talking about today. Um, a bit of her, just a bit of her background and thinking about O'Connor in solitude. Uh, many people picture O'Connor during the last 13 years of her life. 
uh, at home in Milledgeville, Georgia. O'Connor suffered from lupus, we all know, uh, and lived under the care of her watchful mother. She moved um, from bed across her room to her typewriter, and she sat writing each morning. And out of her western facing bedroom window, uh, you can see the setting that informed her daily life. Beyond the back door, you can walk through the pastures of Andalusia and see that distant line of pine trees marching against her eternal sky. But this portrait of O'Connor as a solitary artist, languishing, able to write only for a few hours a day, is only one snapshot of her life, says Jean Cash. Between 1955 and 1963, uh, in fact, Jean Cash documented O'Connor giving nearly 60 public lectures and readings of her work. She was an accomplished speaker on the craft of writing fiction, on her work as a Catholic artist, uh, and, and she is a woman who holds a master's degree. In the 1950s, I see O'Connor not simply as a woman of faith, but as an active and important intellectual. Her letters with Carolyn Gordon, uh, her writing mentor, further show us this, and they show us particularly O'Connor's use of landscape and how she learned to use landscapes in her writing to transmit her vision of faith. Early in their uh, correspondence, Carolyn Gordon uh, wants O'Connor, she's giving O'Connor feedback on wise blood, and she wants her to expand her use of landscape, and she says to O'Connor, Suppose we think of a scene in your novel as a scene in a play. Any scene in any play takes place on some sort of set. I feel that the sets in your play are quite wonderful, but you never let us see them. A spotlight follows every character. It's a little like the spotlight a burglar uses when he's cracking a safe. It illuminates a small circle and the rest of the stage is in darkness. It would be better, Carolyn Gordon tells Flannery O'Connor, it would be better if you occasionally used a spotlight large enough to illuminate the corners of the room or of the landscapes of the setting, right? For those corners have gone on existing all through the most dramatic moments. Uh, another story um, Carolyn Gordon gives um, Flannery O'Connor feedback on is uh, a good man is hard to find. And Gordon says to O'Connor in, in, in response to a draft, the, the story does not have enough composition of scene to borrow a phrase from St. Ignatius of Loyola. It is not well enough located in time and place. Remember that the Lord made the world before he made Adam and Eve. I particularly miss landscape after the misfit comes on the scene. And then her critique continues telling, asking O'Connor, expand the use of landscape. And so as I read O'Connor's stories, and, and we're, we're always so captured by her characters and their dialogue and the conflict, um, sort of the invisible scaffolding of her stories is in the landscapes. Um, You'll really see this ecological imagination at work in stories like Greenleaf and A View of the Woods, and they, those are two of my favorite O'Connor stories, um, especially to teach and reread. But you'll also see it in much of her mature fiction. Um, and for those of you who are new to O'Connor, it's a nice entry point into thinking about her work. Um, and for scholars, this is, this is an area we continue to mine um, and learn from her. Uh, Louise Westling writes about O'Connor's fiction, the land, the trees, the sky, and the relentless eye of the sun are so powerfully charged in her fiction that they become some of her fiction's most powerful characters. Sarah Petrides says that O'Connor's landscapes reflect history and influence the future. And this is why I've returned again and again to Flannery O'Connor's landscapes and why I believe she is a writer that remains well worth our attention. Thank you.
I'm going to pass the baton on. It looks like my electricity might go out any minute. I'm going to pass the baton along to Jessica Hooten Wilson. Thank you. Wow. Okay. So, what amazing scholars to come behind. Um, I am not prepared to be a grand finale. I am very thankful for the work that these women are doing, and I am thankful for the invitation to get to be part of this conversation. I want to show a little bit that Flannery's work is not exhaustible. I think there is a misbelief that Flannery does not have much to show us and that we should stop mining, um, maybe for things, gems that we can't find anymore. Most people, when they read Flannery O'Connor, they're focused on her violence. Um, they find it horrific, and as she would say, they have hold of the wrong horror. The horror, as um, Flannery would say, is, is not so much that there's violence in the world, as Jennifer just pointed out. Um, that's just being a Christian realist. That's what is out there. There is violence in the world. I think what people found horrific is that O'Connor saw that violence could open up for a moment of grace. And that's what Flannery is after. For her, violence was merely to show the world that they were living with a distorted vision of things, that the distortions of the world had become natural to them, that they didn't realize that they had a, vault, a faulty perception. And so step one was just recognizing that they were actually seeing things incorrectly. Uh, as the misfit would say, they were, Jesus upended everything. Well, what he really did was just put things right again, that we're all just kind of walking around. And so Flannery was doing that for the end goal to eventually be the beatific vision, as, as Jennifer mentioned. And so a lot of her work is not really um, damning fires and uh, kind of like Jonathan Edwards reinventing the fire and brimstone. She's actually looking at purgatorial fire. She's trying to save her characters. Um, more importantly, I think she's trying to save her readers. And so her work was supposed to be a starting place for conversion for a lot of her um, modern skeptical characters. But the end goal was the end goal was sanctity. So rather than focus on the violence, which gets some of these really lost characters to recognize their fallenness, I have started looking more at O'Connor's saints. Where does she look at sanctity and what does she discover about what holiness would look like? So if we look at just a few stories for the sake of time, uh, for examples, we see in Greenleaf, in the displaced person and in the river, we see examples of the modern skeptics who have this blind vision. We see people like Mrs. May, who was a good Christian woman with a large respect for religion, but of course she did not believe a word of it was true, and actually is ashamed to witness someone following Jesus, and we'll get to that in a second. We also have Mrs. McIntyre and the displaced person who contacts a priest merely for an economic advantage to get an extra worker on her farm. And when that farmer is uh, causing more problems than he's worth, tries to get rid of him, tries to, to rehome the immigrant and uh, is confronted by the priest who says, Christ, and the word makes her wince. She said she had uh, embarrassment for the word Christ the way her mother had been embarrassed by the word. So we have these characters that are very skeptical about belief, they're very skeptical, skeptical about its reality, and of course they will have a violent upending. And then we have poor Harry Ashfield, who has already been mentioned before by Amy, and he is a young man who doesn't think he counts, um, doesn't know how to see things rightly, his parents have not taught him how to see the world. Um, when he heard the word Jesus, at one point he says, before that day, he would have thought Jesus was a word like, oh, damn or that it meant somebody had tried to cheat you out of something. So it's a word that's been used as a, a curse word in his household. It was a joke in his family. It was not something that had any powerful reality. And then these characters come into contact with other characters for whom Jesus is not a joke and Jesus is effectual. Uh, one of my favorite characters in all of Henry O'Connor's fiction is Mrs. Greenleaf, of course, the title character of the Greenleaf story. And Mrs. Greenleaf does something every day called prayer healing, in which she cuts out of the newspaper all of the stories of the accounts of women who have been raped, of criminals who had escaped, uh, the divorces of movie stars, and she buries them in the ground. And then she lays on top of them every morning, 
crying out, using Jesus' name for effect. She believes in the reality of calling out his name. And like a mystic in the 20th century, she says, Jesus, Jesus, stab me in the heart. And Mrs. May is the stand-in for all of us modern skeptics who read this and are very uncomfortable with Mrs. Greenleaf's belief. But O'Connor's also trying to shock those of us, not just out of our skepticism, but maybe out of our domestication of God. Maybe for those of us who uh, don't believe that there's a lot of power in the name of Jesus or who, who that very saying makes uncomfortable. And here we have an extreme vision of someone who's like a prophet in the desert laying on these stories and praying in front of Mrs. May. And Mrs. May tells her, you know, get up and do something practical like your laundry or do your gardening. Um, and in the story, I think that we also get to see how we're supposed to respond. Um, I think that we're supposed to understand that there is effect here in this story. Um, if I can look at the displaced person and also look at uh, the river for my last examples, we have in the displaced person the priest himself, and he's not really given a name. But he's the only character who is described by Mrs. McIntyre as an idiot child. And if anyone's familiar with Leonard O'Connor's work, you know that um, the presence of God is just as powerful in the idiot as it is in the genius, according to O'Connor's letters. And so here, Mrs. McIntyre is not seen correctly. She is seeing him as an idiot, but we should be seeing it as holy foolishness. And that's what we have in the priest. He gives us an example of maybe not extreme sanctity, not the prophet in the desert kind of sanctity, um, but a sanctity that is maybe more within reach. Um, what Erzgen Balthazar would say uh, is ordinary sanctity and not customary sanctity. And I think we also see that with Mrs. Conan. Um, Mrs. Conan watches Harry Ashfield. She introduces him to Jesus. Uh, he said before that he had learned that morning that Jesus was a carpenter who had made him. Uh, she has shared the gospel with him. She has baptized Harry Ashfield, and when his parents try to pay for the babysitting, she won't accept the money. And this always reminds me of that passage where David is supposed to build an altar, and he says, I will not sacrifice. Um, it doesn't cost me anything. I will not offer sacrifice. It costs me nothing. And here we have Mrs. Conan who needs the money and refuses the money because she recognizes how much Harry is suffering, and she suffers with him, and she will not offer a sacrifice that doesn't cost her. And so I think we see in these examples um, that we're supposed to walk away from this understanding that there are, as O'Connor writes, many types of saints and many souls to be saved. And she says, I am quite interested in saving my soul, but I see this as a long process. And the only moment that concerns me is the one I'm living in. And so here we have O'Connor inviting us to pursue this long process. And now I think everyone is going to appear magically on your screen and we're going to answer questions. <laughs> and there's a baby. There is a baby. Thank you all so much. Um, those are so wonderful to listen to. Um, so I wanted to sort of jump into some questions. Um, I have a few, but I actually want to start with um, some questions from two of our um, partners at Collegium our, that are also co-sponsors. Um, so the first is coming from um, Terrence Sweeney, who is the editor um, at Genealogies of Modernity. And this is, I guess, a question probably for all of you, um, maybe in particular um, for Jessica, um, and actually probably all of you now that I'm looking at it more. So um, he, he writes, O'Connor returns often to the image of modern life as being haunted by Christ. In particular, in Wise Blood, Hazel is unable to escape Christ. How does this speak to the modern condition, and are we still haunted by Christ? Do you want me to jump in here first? Um, if you'd like to. Um, I, said yeah. my name. I wasn't sure if that was my cue. Yeah, I think that, well, I've been looking more probably at how we have gone a little bit further than Flannery's time. Um, whereas we are being haunted by Christ, I think that we are so like deaf and blind to that haunting at this point. It's not that it's not happening. Christ is going to continue running after people. Um, but I think that we are really good at anesthetizing ourselves uh, so that we're not able to hear or see Christ at work as much as possible. Um, I think of Graham Greene has that great line at the end of The Power and the Glory, 
in which um, the priest says that Christ, like all of us, should be running from Christ. Like if we actually realized and didn't domesticate God and make him so tame and understandable and reduce him, we would all be scared to death. Like this is the God that set fire to bushes. This is the God that rose people from the dead. Um, but that's the kind of God the whiskey priest says all of us would be running from. I don't know. Should I jump in, Jessica? Okay. Anyway, I'll just, I'll just answer it. Okay. Um, so I think there are two senses in which we're Christ haunted. One is specific to Flannery's understanding, and then one the um, the next is sort of like what I think. So when it comes to Flannery, I think that um, especially her nihilist and her atheist characters are Christ haunted in the sense that they define themselves, not actually in the autonomous way that they think they're defining themselves, but they've defined themselves against Christ. And they define themselves against, um, against Christ and his church. So if you think about uh, the misfit and what he's, you know, the sense in which he characterizes himself as a misfit and the way that that involves Christ. And if you think of Hazel Motes, whose residing passion was to rid himself of the conviction that Jesus had redeemed him, right? So they can only react against or define themselves against. Um, and that is a very deep sense of being Christ haunted. And I think that Flannery thought that we were all Christ haunted in that sense um, because the Judeo-Christian tradition had formed the West to such an extent that it has formed our secularism and it has formed our atheism. Um, and you just cannot run away from that. But I think, um, just speaking as a, as a moral philosopher um, who swims in an extremely militantly secular context, um, we are, our moral commitments have these Christian roots, right? So we have these commitments to peace and love and concern for the poor and the oppressed, um, but we have it without love of or obedience to Christ. So we have these, Christian ideals, but we have no sense of sin or grace or atonement or penance or redemption. We have righteous anger about injustice, but we don't temper it with Christian humility, mercy, love, or forgiveness. Um, and so I, I think about that a lot, especially lately. Jess, I could jump in, but you might want to, I don't know if you want to go on to another question. Sure, yeah, actually the next question I think is more um, probably for Amy and Christine, I think. Um, so this is actually from Katie, who um, everyone heard from earlier. Um, she's the editor at large at Dappled Things. Um, so she writes, as the flip side to her solitude, O'Connor's letters in The Habit of Being reveal a profoundly social side of her character. She says, quote, mail is eventful to me and plans visits to friends' houses whenever her health allows it. Just as Flannery did because of her illnesses, many people have recently had to recalibrate the way that we um, relate to our social selves and our solitude. What do you think Flannery has to tell us about how we can order our lives to create connection to others um, outside our immediate circles, despite difficulties, and why that is so important, um, especially for those engaged in the creation of art um, or intellectual work? Um, and I think, you know, I'm thinking here even of like her drawings, um, her letters obviously is sort of like of cultivation of that sort of solitude so um. well um i'll jump in right away um and and just speak to the letter writing aspect of this so letter writing is something i've thought a lot about um just in my own life and also through o'connor and other people uh, people's letters i've read um there's this beautiful line that goethe has about letters he says that letters are the most beautiful most immediate breath of life and there's another writer i love who was an atheist um vivian gornick who wrote an essay on um, letter writing and she said that when we write a letter we are sitting alone in a room with our own thoughts in the conjured presence of another person which i think is very much sounds like a description of prayer um, and for me I, I kept up a very intense correspondence with one person over a period of five years and um, during that time we really noticed this separation or this difference between our in-person relationship or, which i would also put in in the same 
um, category with as a phone conversation relationship or a Zoom meeting relationship, we put that in a very different category than our correspondence, our written correspondence. Um, the, the tone of that, the kinds of things we were able to convey, um, the depth of, say, experience, reflection, um, the tangents we're willing to go on, et cetera, would none of which would be even remotely appropriate in um, a, or very common in um, a face-to-face -face conversation. But um, I think it allows you a depth of intimacy. And so if you think about O'Connor sitting al alone in a room in the conjured presence of these other artists and friends and writers, um, she really was not only being able to process her own life um, through those letters, but able to think very deeply about her own fiction. And I really think the reason why we have the, this um, collection, Mystery and Manners, and even what contributed to her ability to give these 60 lectures um, was really that that ongoing daily reflection that she engaged in with through these letters. So, Christine, I'm sure you have something to say because you have um, edited this book of letters. I I have nothing to say because my electricity keeps blinking out with this horrendous storm outside. Um, I missed the question, which is typical of me. But I did want to respond to the other question, if I may, which is, and then you can repeat the question maybe to me, which is that idea of um. Uh, is modern life haunted by Christ? And I love what Jennifer had said, um, because from the perspective of a writer and someone who thinks of um, writing fiction as O'Connor did, I think that haunted by Christ means faced with moral choices, much like Jen talked about. And, um, but, but the word haunted suggests a kind of passivity and what uh, or that elements are somehow out of our control. And what O'Connor shows us, and this occurs in her letters as well as her fiction, what O'Connor shows us is that the fiction writer ha uh, presents the world as a collection of characters who make distinct and answerable choices, that um, no action is isolated, that a series of actions, you know, the, the world progresses like a series of dominoes, and we can stretch back into our social history and we can look ahead to the future. And so um, I think O'Connor, and, and again, I see this in her letters and her fiction, when she thinks about being haunted by Christ, the writer's actions are the answer to um, avoiding the passivity of just sort of being at the mercy of what happens. So I hope that answers something. Thank you. Um, and I'm actually, I, um, I'm going to just ask one question, then we're actually going to open it up for Q&A. Um, so this um, question here, I'm wondering, um, and I guess any of you who want to speak to it, um, it would be great. So I was struck by the fact that um, she writes in one of her essays that the primary effect that a story should have is enjoyment. Um, she says, I think that the best reason to hear a story read is that it can stimulate that primary enjoyment. Um, and I guess I'm wondering if you think there's a tension between that end that she articulates um, and the sort of grotesque um, or shocking and violent elements in so many of her stories, um, or even just the sort of oddity of them sometimes. Uh, so that's, yeah. I don't know if anyone wants to start. Yeah, Jen, go ahead. Um, I mean, I don't find any tension in that, but then again, like, I love horror. <laughs> <laughs> And, and and weird fiction and, and things like this. But I, I mean, she's just an amazing writer. And so many people um, are drawn to her because of that. I mean, it's, it's intensely pleasurable to read her because of what she can do with language. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also like a puzzle. Every time I read Flannery O'Connor, like anew, um, and there's still some of her stories that I, you know, haven't read yet and so I'm literally reading them with fresh eyes. I don't understand them the first time I read them. I'm just like, what is this? <laughs> then I go back and it's like, right? Um, and then you're like, okay, I think I have it figured out, but you wanna to talk to like 10 people about it and hear what they said. It's just, it's incredibly pleasurable on many different levels. Um, and, and I think it's a similar sort of thing, like when you're reading or, you, or you're watching horror, which, which I would defend as real art, but that's a separate conversation. 
Um, well, Jess, when you asked the question, um, I immediately thought of something that Tolkien says that, that really reminded me of, of this. He talks about how literature, well, he's talking about fairy stories, but he says that it is, it offers us satisfactions to our deepest desires. And um, the, the, our oldest, deepest desire, he says, is the escape from death. Um, and then he goes on to say that the satisfaction is brought about by this turn, which I think Flannery would call the um, revelation. And so, and I think that what precipitate, precipitates that in, in both Tolkien and O'Connor and in many, many writers is um, violence. Um, so I think that that in terms of that enjoyment or the, as I'm, I'm calling it the satisfaction of our desires, right? Um, it's actually very connected to that experience or that passage through violence, so. Yep, there I am. Uh, O'Connor loved reading her stories out loud and she was so funny. Um, there's a um, neuroscientist who I know and he defines humor as mirth and um, that says it has its basis in a kind of recognition that we recognize ourselves or we recognize something true and believable about her characters. And that's what makes us smile and recognition. Uh, there's a great story um, many of you have heard if you've read different biographies of um, O'Connor that I just looked up where um, O'Connor spends a weekend with Carolyn Gordon and they, and they ask her to read a story and um, they say, read the shortest one. And then um, O'Connor reads, a good man is hard to find for the crowd. And um, Van Wyck Brooks later remarks to Miss Jenkins about O'Connor that it's a shame someone with so much talent should look upon life as a horror story. Malcolm Cowley was very polite and asked me if I had a wooden leg. So O'Connor just loved the response to her stories and she really reveled in, in reading story well. And, and I think she did enjoy that. I can add a couple things. So I think there is immense pleasure because they are funny, but also the violence is pleasurable. <laughs> Who does not want to throw that book at Mrs. Turpin when you're in that reading room? I mean, her her violence is kind of cathartic in some of the places because you really want to do that until you realize that you're Mrs. Turpin and, and then there's like that whole epidemic moment where you have to really examine your heart. Um, but I think that's the second part, which is the anagogical vision that was always the aim of her stories. So the first part was the mere pleasure that you get reading it and the experience of it. And then the second part is the reflection. And it's not that you had to take it apart and dig out the meaning, but you experienced the meaning and were brought to a new way of knowing that allowed you to participate in a deeper reading of the story. And I think that second part she's always after. So it's never the violence for the mere pleasure of the violence itself. It's always pointing you onward, right, to something else. So I'm going to here I have a th the first question from um, here in the Q&A section. Um, so this is from Mark Franzen. And he writes, uh, beyond the original solitude of childhood and the solitude of her illness, is the solitude of being a Catholic in the South important to Flannery O'Connor's stories? I don't know if anyone wants to jump in first. It's not directed at any one of you specifically. Yeah, Jen. Yeah, I mean, I think, well, I mean, just speaking as someone who lives in what I think is the least Catholic state in the US, which would be South Carolina, um, I th where, you know, you are an actual religious minority. Um, I, I don't know um, if it's so much a solitude as it is an otherness, right? So, um, the fact that you're a Catholic, well, for me, it's double because I'm a Catholic and I'm a Yankee, even though I'm from Ohio, but, I just, <laughs> but anyway, that's what, you know, that's what my neighbors call me. And uh, it's just more like an othering that happens. And so that when you are with other Catholics, um, you, you can, you can do your, you can be Catholic in a way that you can't really be Catholic with other people. And I'm I'm not sure, I'm not sure that I would describe it as solitude so much as I would describe it as an othering. Yeah. Outgroup. Uh, 
Um, I, I'm trying to remember if it was two years ago, there was a Flannery O'Connor group in Spain. There was a conference in Spain and a number of O'Connor translators, uh, people who are translating O'Connor to um, Spanish, talked about the difficulty of translating her in specifically the way you've asked about, that, that othering, that, um, that kind of solitude when you're a strange, you're the strange one in the land. And that, um, and these Spanish scholars had suggested that O'Connor would not have been the writer she was had she lived in Spain, had she lived in a Catholic country, had she not been able to position herself in this way. So it's a great question. There's a lot, there's a lot written on it. Um, it's a wonderful question to pick up on. So um, I have another question here, unless you guys have something else you want to add. Jessica or Amy? Okay. So this is actually for Amy. Um, this is from Eric. Uh, he asks, is Francis Tarwater a child? Is he too alone to be a child or is he too decisive to be a child? So I think that's a question for me because of my talk on childhood, but unfortunately, I have not reread The Violent Barrett Away in the last two years. I will be very soon rereading it because I, I am preparing to lead this um, discussion section. So um, I'm happy to pass that off on to any of my co-panelists that have something to say. Looks like Jessica. You said Amy, and so I thought, is Francis Tarwater a child? And then my brain zoned out. What was the second part then? Uh, yeah, the second part was, um, so is he too alone to be a child, or yeah. is he too decisive to be a child? Are the well, two actually, I think the reason that she chose the age that she did is he's right at that point of defiance, right? He's 14. And so he is trying to figure out who he is, and I think that's key to his character, right? Um, if he was any younger, then we have the problems we have with Raver, for example, or with Lucette Carmody in that novel, in which they're so much younger that they follow the authorities above them without a lot of questioning. And O'Connor thought following authority was a great thing, um, but Tarwater doesn't. And, and he's, he's making that turn towards trying to, to relinquish himself of all authority so that he can actually make himself who he wants to be, which of course he doesn't know what that looks like. Uh, so when the devil gets into his mind and starts saying, it's not the Jesus or the devil that's the problem, it's the Jesus or you, he's at that, that point where he has to make that decision by himself, or he thinks he's by himself to make that decision. If he actually looked around him, he has people there, right, um, that could help him. There's um, uh, Buford Munson, the name slip. Hubert Munson is there, the family's there, ready to take care of him. There's any number of people that are, are willing to be that kind of lead for him. Um, and yet, uh, he doesn't look for any authority except for his own. Yeah, so we have another uh, question here from Chuck. Uh, he says, O'Connor certainly didn't act like a disabled person, but arguably she was, given her medical condition. Did she ever view herself as a disabled person and in what way do you think her medical condition influenced her? I can jump in and, and just talk a little bit about her as a child. So she wasn't disabled as a child, but she definitely had a view of herself as a misfit. So she had, um, she always described herself as this child with full, with a mouthful of braces, and she wore corrective shoes when she was little. Um, she, she saw herself as really an odd bird. Um, and I think that consciousness carried with her into a later period of more extreme disability, but not that there was any form of disability as a child, but she definitely felt always that she was um, different from her peers, but I think that sense of difference had a lot more to do with what was going on inside of her than it had to do with anything physical, and that's probably true even um, throughout her life. I think um, I think with O'Connor, I I think that the physical aspects of lupus were something that she downplayed incredibly. Um, I was just reading the other day um, about how she was going to speak at the University of Chicago. Um, Eudora Welty had canceled, and so O'Connor was taking over for a five-day lecture and reading series. And um, because of bad weather, the plane from um, Atlanta had to land in Louisville, 
And then she had to take a nine hour bus to Chicago, um, get through the world on her crutches, and, you know, pretty significant pain some of the time. And I think it, it's something that she put such a, a brave face on. And, um, and I, I suspect it really um, affected her far more than she ever let on. And that she, I think she felt very private about that as well. Didn't want people to talk about it. Was upset when Time Magazine mentioned it in a re review, if I remember that correctly. Yeah, if I can just quote her, because that's well said, Christine. Um, but I love that quote where she downplays it and someone said, you know, how does your sickness affect your work? And she says, it don't, as I generally type with my hands and not my feet. <laughs> um, so another question here, um, this is from Mary Finnegan. She says, do you think that Flannery has something special to say to women? Um, it is interesting that the panelists here are all women. Go ahead, Jen. Okay, so, I mean, I, I think, well, there are a couple of things to say about Flannery and gender. Um, the first is that just as a matter of auto, I mean, as a matter of biography, like she really resisted from a very early age, um, the gender stereotypes that were placed on her pretty forcefully, especially by her mother. Um, so the ideals of Southern girlhood, um, which persist to this day some, somewhat, <laughs> um, were, were really intense for her growing up. Um, and she didn't want to have anything to do with it. Um, this was like a huge, you know, the, the, uh, the kind of glamorous dresses and the hospitality and the, the, um, the attention to so-called girly things, you know, and, and she just wanted to be by herself and reading and writing. Um, and so I think from an early age, she was struggling against gender stereotypes and trying to figure out who she was. Um, as a girl, as a woman, knowing that she didn't fit the role that society had carved out for her. Um, but I think as a fiction writer, um, what's interesting is that she really, so she changed her name <laughs> um, she, when she was, I, I think it was when she was at Iowa, right? She, that's when she started going, not by Mary Flannery, but by Flannery. And a huge part of that she admitted was that Flannery seemed gender neutral. And she used to um, really take delight when she would get rejection letters to Mr. Flannery O'Connor. Um, and so I think she didn't want to be seen as a woman writer, or I don't think she wanted to be defined by her gender. Um, but I would also say that in comparison with other female writers, you know, she, she talks about Margaret Mitchell. <laughs> um, and she also talks about the premiere of Gone with the Wind in Atlanta and like how absurd she thought it was. Um, but by comparison to what people think of as like um, chick lit or female writers, you know, she, I mean, she just does not fit in that. You know, she's doing, she's really hard on her female characters, really hard on her female characters. Um, and and so she's she's not writing in a way that's supposed to make women feel good about themselves. Um, so I'm not sure um, that she has an I'm I'm not sure she has a special appeal to to women other than that she's just she's an incredible writer and and she happens to be a, a woman. Um, but maybe other people have something more insightful to say there. That was well said. I, I hardly want to add anything to it. I will say that a lot of her um, colleagues, like at Iowa, and then of course her teachers, were mostly male. And so some people find that her style was heavily influenced uh, by a lot of the men teachers in her lives. And even the works that she's reading, she's not reading female writers. And so it's not it's not a group that she's belonging to. She's reading Dostoevsky. She's re reading Edgar Allan Poe. Um, she's not reading. She doesn't have a model really for what she's trying to do. She's kind of making it on her own. And maybe it's her otherness in that sense that gives her permission to kind of find her own way. I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, I don't think my, the appeal that she has is not necessarily for me about being a woman. If anything, I think 
the way that her um, nice Milledgeville ladies found her so off-putting that she was writing these not nice stories, that was probably more of the appeal to me was, oh, thank you that this woman is not fitting in this mold uh, and that she's willing to go out there and write these not nice stories. I think um, it's the reason why she had a relationship with Carolyn Gordon for 13 years um, was because Carolyn Gordon was, you know, the only woman who she knew well, who was doing, uh, who had, who had forged the path before her. And you can actually um, trace the path of like where Carolyn Gordon did speaking engagements and Flannery O'Connor follows in the exact same, you know, from St. Mary's to here to there. Um, but in 13 years of looking through their letters and contextual material on both sides of the women, never once do they talk about being a woman writer. Carolyn Gordon talks about it once to say, um, you know, it's really sort of a despicable kind of thing. Like, what, what is she doing? It's, it's an unnatural kind of thing. Um, but never do she and Flannery have any engaged conversation about being a woman writer at all. So. When she was a little girl, um, I think she was already toying with, um, with the seeing herself in more of a male role. She gave herself the name Lord Flannery. So she would sign her books, the little books that she used to write, she would sign them Lord Flannery. Um, and she had lots of other little names and I'm, I'm struggling to remember. I, I know that at least one of them also had a male connotation. So she liked to see herself, I think, in at least a gender, gender neutral role, if not, um, if not uh, ask actually masculine role. Um, I'm also thinking about the story that I'm working on right now, Mistaken Identity, which is about a goose named Herman who um, eventually lays an egg. <laughs> and so then, and she actually had a, a bird exactly like this who ended up being a model for one of her art classes, but he was Herman and then eventually he laid seven eggs and um, everybody realized that, that Herman's Henrietta, but it's actually kind of a story about gender identity and about, um, about that identity being mistaken. So I think it's something maybe she didn't talk a lot about, but it, definitely in her own mind with herself, she, she toyed with these, um, these different ways of seeing herself or naming herself. Mm. Next question um, is from Sarah Damewood. And she asks, what is your sense of Flannery's point of view on racism? Well, I know, I think Jessica might be able to speak to that, but um, let me just, <clears throat> I don't necessarily want to speak on Flannery O'Connor's, um, her own perspective on racism. Um, what I've been thinking about recently, because I've been working on this exhibit with Emery, um, it's actually going to be a much larger exhibit. My piece of it is the juvenilia, but it's going to include um, a, a sort of parallel exhibit of the art of Benny Andrews, who is um, who was an African American artist. Um, his art has recently been brought into the Museum of Modern Art in New York, um, and he ended up illustrating a um, elephantine edition of Everything That Rises Must Converge. So if you have an extra three thousand dollars sitting around, you can buy it for yourself. This giant, giant book um, that's beautifully illustrated. But what's significant about it is um, for this conversation is that he wrote an afterword for this book that's only four pages long. Um, it's really beautiful. And he very much goes into not only, he, he grew up like 30 miles down the road from her um, and only was born like five years apart. So he, he talks about their different worlds they inhabited and how he really wouldn't have he wouldn't have been invited as a guest to um, Flannery O'Connor's house, et cetera. And he's, he brings out some of the most um, racially incriminating things that, that Flannery O'Connor said in her letters. But then he gets to this line. So he's asking him, so he's wrestling with this question, why as an African-American man will I choose to illustrate one of these stories? Um, and he comes up with, with this line. I just want to read it to you. Um, he says, but the reason is that I've looked into O'Connor's works and I've found more than the superficial, much more. She confronts the leaping flames and churning waters. I've looked into her works and have found revelations. Um, and then at the very end of the story, he says, so, so now it's really up to the reader, um, and not the end of the story, but end of his afterwards. He says, it's up to the reader of the story and the viewer of my artwork to look at two Southerners and wonder. 
wonder and hopefully wonder some more. So I'm going to put, I'm going to give this to um, Jessica, but this is just a wonderful resource if you want to start thinking about Flannery O'Connor and race. And then the other thing that I would point you to is Alice Walker's work, which is also happens to be held at Emory University, but she has a beautiful essay um, called Beyond the Peacock, something like Reconstructing Flannery O'Connor. And it's this parallel story of her, I, Jessica, are you holding it up? Um, it's this beautiful parallel story of her going to visit her own childhood home and then O'Connor's down the road with her own mother. And, and honestly, I think this essay functions a lot like um, Flannery O'Connor's own work functions. Um, and you see this, you see more than what she's saying. You see this parallel of her own relationship with her mother and you see both her love and her hate for Flannery. Um, so it's a beautiful, beautiful place to start thinking about Flannery and race. So that's what that's, so I'm just gonna pass along those resources to you. Well, um, you're that way, Jennifer. Jennifer, you were going to raise your hand. Do you wanna say something? Oh, like super brief. Um, all I wanna say is that it was really important her, to her to uh, portray her characters realistically. Um, so back, even as far back as Iowa, people were trying to censor her because she was using racist language um, and she refused to be censored. She's like, this is the way people talk. Um, and, and I need to present uh, these the people that I'm writing about truthfully. Um, and I think that we really need to keep that aim in mind when we read her fiction. Um, and 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 try to realize that um, there is a kind of honesty about her characters that she's trying to portray. Well, um, I just got done reviewing Angela O'Donnell's Radical Ambivalence for First Things, and so I've been investigating this question probably more than my normal scholarship investigates it. Um, one of the things that I think is really important with O'Connor is to recognize the difference between uh, her uncensored letters and her art. Because she constantly says in her letters that she's not good and that she's always falling short of what she wishes she could be. She's very honest and humble and she doesn't uplift uh, her most negative qualities as the ideal. So even in her letters, as she's struggling really to get a handle on the changes that are occurring in the civil rights movement and that are opening her eyes to things because she was an integrationist. I mean, that was something that she changed, but she was kind of on her own as an integrationist in her household, surrounded by governors that were not. And um, so even though she felt that and wanted that and had that as an ideal, she was not supported in that. And so she's really coming to terms with it in her letters. And so I think we have to show some grace in that, um, that if we are at all further along in reconciliation, in part, it's because she also did some of the hard work earlier and we're getting to read her stories. I know for me, having grown up in the South and being surrounded by people who said things that I'm embarrassed I ever overheard and that I'm complicit to listening to, um, O'Connor opened my eyes. O'Connor's stories were so much further along than she was personally and biographically. And her stories are the reason that I was able to see people as neighbors and that I was able to see past um, the, the worldview that was handed out to me or that I inherited. And I think that that's what O'Connor is trying to do for us is that she's, she's not recognizing that she is a saint in this. And, um, and so that radical ambivalence, that great term that o O'Donnell comes up with is really trying to say that there was a tension between herself and her art. Um, and when it comes to her art, her art is what Alice Walker loved. Her art is what Toni Morrison loved. Her art is, gives us a vision um, that is prophetic, that is unifying, that is beautiful. Um, her fiction gives us something to aspire to. She is castigating her racist characters and she is doing so from a point that they would actually listen to because realism is her goal. Uh, she was not belittling the racists in her fiction um, in a way that they wouldn't be able to hear it. So even though she casts upon them and says, like, this is wrong, the way that you feel and the way that you think about things is wrong, she's doing so, but first getting on their side and showing them a way out of that side. I think that's really important to remember, um, that she, she is in no way just saying, you guys are the sinners and we have it all figured out once we've progressed past this. Um, she's saying, we're all complicit, we're all guilty, let's move 
past this. Let's become better. Let's repent and move forward because, um, of course, that's how justice can happen. And I think her art is that move towards justice. I have just one or two things to say. Um, one is that um, there is a work of hers that I can't teach in my classroom. I can't bring it into my classroom. I'm too uncomfortable with the language. Can't do it. And I won't do it. And I won't put my students in a position of having to listen to me wax uh, intellectual on racial epithets you know, when a student should be in a classroom and, and not have to be faced with that. Um, I think there's, there's courses where you can talk about race and things like that, but, but I, I'm disturbed by a good deal of radical ambivalence. I'm disturbed by a lot of her letters and I can't teach some of her work. Um, I had a problem with some of the language of Carolyn Gordon in my own book, and I went back and forth with the publisher on um, what to do about that and how I felt about that. Uh, O'Connor, in, a, in, a, in an interview, said something very interesting, though. She said, um, white people and colored people are used to milling around in the South. Industrialization, she said, is what will change the culture of the South, not integration. So she really had her eye, I think, on a different place, the sort of uh, being aware and upset about how technology was changing the landscape of the South more so than, you know, you know, I think so many people just thought the manners of the South, you know, people got along, people could, you know, just continue what they were doing, whereas industrial technology was much more um, disturbing to her, maybe. That's just a guess. The last thing I'll say is I read the most interesting, I wish I could tell you who, who said it, maybe you guys read it. It was on one of the Flannery O'Connor websites. Um, uh, after the recent incident with um, Amy Cooper and Chris Cooper in the dog park, and someone compared their matching last names to the matching purple hats in everything that rises must converge. And that single comment will change the way I teach that story. Just that sort of bizarre, strange insight of uh, difference and commonality and collision and uh, is, so, is so disturbing and revealing. And um, so. Um, so that was Mike. Mike Murphy is the one who pointed that out. Oh, Mike did that. Yeah, it was amazing. I, th I just thought that was so insightful. Thank you, Mike. Out of time, but I have to just say one thing about the story you won't teach. I know that the artificial in has an offensive title. But one of the things I love about that that is so prophetic is that story shows how societally constructed race is, and that it is a power that is inherited when you have the white grandfather teaching the white grandson that people are not just people, they're white and black. I mean, you, you see it and she sees it in a way that most people in her culture would not have seen that. Yeah. I love teaching that story because most of my students, even in Arkansas, they're not recognizing that it is a socially constructed distinction, right? And it's not, so, anyways, that's the reason I still teach that. So I wanted to make one plug for that story because I think it is worth teaching. But, um, Jessica, do I have time to just show something really quick? Uh, sure, go ahead and then we'll do probably one last question since we're... Okay, we're I just wanted to share my screen because um, this ties in with what um, <laughs> what Christine was just saying about the uh, matching hats. And so this is one of Benny Andrews' illustrations um, and you see the matching hats. Right there. And the sons. Yes. And the sons. Yeah. Mm. That's nice. Thanks, Amy. Um, so I think there's lots of questions in here, but unfortunately, I think we only have time for one more. Um, so this one is coming from Evan McGraw, um, and he's saying that it's actually specifically to Amy's talk, but I think probably has some connections to um, everyone's in some ways. So um, he says, I'm curious to hear from any of you. Uh, while solitude can certainly give us a glimpse of the mystery of existence, it can also be kind of boring sometimes. Is boredom in solitude the result of original sin as a failure to appreciate good and beautiful things in this life, or is it a proper function of the human being since it's fitting that we won't be able to be fully satisfied with anything in this life until the beatific vision? He says also, thank you for your talks. This has been lovely. And just a disclaimer, that's actually one of my students and it's a girl. <laughs> <laughs> 
All right, four more students, you graduated. Oh, um, um, oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead, Jamie. Um, no, go ahead, go ahead, that's fine. I, I think that um, boredom is a condition of the artist. And if you're not willing to be bored, you are not going to be an artist. And sort of, again, I, I take Flannery O'Connor more from the perspective of what is she doing as a writer to create? And she said she would just sit there at the desk and if nothing happened, like she just would sit there and wait for, you know, the Holy Spirit, somebody to start talking to her. And, and um, so I think boredom is, um, to be expected. <laughs> Not only that, but I, yeah, I, think, I think that she in some sense welcomed boredom. Um, she was always talking about not just the act of writing, but one of the acts that she felt really aided her, her writing was the practice, I think she might have called it a habit or a discipline of staring. And one time she said, um, there's a certain grain of stupidity that the writer of fiction can hardly do without, and this is the quality of having to stare of not getting the point at once. And I think there's a certain boredom in, <laughs> inherent in staring, right? The longer you look at one object, the more of the world you see in it. The serious fiction writer always writes about the whole world. So, um, and she talks about staring all the time, right? So you just see her as this, sitting on her porch, staring at her birds, staring even more at other people reacting to her birds um, and trying to get to that, that whole vision. Right. Um, and I don't think if you're not comfortable with boredom, first of all, forget being a writer, as Christine said, forget, um, forget being a writer. And, and also, if you're not comfortable with boredom, then you couldn't in, um, engage in that sort of intense observation that she, that she made part of her life. I just want to say that I think boredom is totally beautiful. <laughs> like, like, <laughs> I mean, I know boredom is boring, but boredom is so crucial and important um, in part because I think boredom is like the mistress of, you know, receptivity. Like it's when you're bored um, that you get inspiration, that ideas come to you. And I think that, you know, it's when we're bored that we're silent, that we, we sort of get in this space where we're not distracted right? We're not active, right? Like our mind's not going on something. Um, usually we're doing like menial tasks, but if you're like me, we're like, so I'm like a religious walker after dinner, except for now I can't walk. But anyway, <laughs> um, it's like, that's when you, it's just like, you're just walking. You're just looking at the same neighborhood that you look at every night, but it's, it's like an incredible freedom. Um, and since I can't walk right now, it's like, I miss it and I miss boredom. Boredom is fantastic. That's my point. I love that. That's exactly right. If I can just add one thing, like when we picture O'Connor, she's sitting in front of a wardrobe that blocked her view of everything else. She yes. could have turned around in her study or her bedroom and actually looked out a window and seen beautiful things. Um, but she doesn't, she faces nothing as she's writing. And she would sit there for hours, the way Christine said, and just focus on nothingness. Uh, so I think that this idea of contemplation that has really been lost in our society, one yeah. way is just to imagine like the leisure of boredom, the, the resting state of our hearts and minds that we now associate with the word boredom. But really it's a matter of openness to contemplation. And Flannery is definitely doing it. Which was, which is actually something that's really lost, especially for children. I think in our time, not enough time being bored. Go bore your children. Yes. Yeah. It's also free. You know, summer camp is a lot of money, and to just have them be bored, it's totally free. <laughs> totally. Well, thank you so much to all of you. This has been just really wonderful. Um, I want to say one quick thing because a lot of people have asked about this in the questions actually. Um, so all of you put forward um, various texts, um, whether it's writing on O'Connor or her own work, um, her short stories, and so people are actually wondering if they can get a list. So um, I want to say, I think hopefully I can say this on behalf of all of you that you can hopefully email me those references um, and I can send them out to everyone um, who is registered because we, you know, I have your email and I'll send that out to you. So for all of you wondering about um, all the, you know, the references, you'll, you'll get those. Um, and then, uh, yeah, just 
as sort of as we come to a close here, um, I wanted to sort of reiterate um, that Amy has a new book coming out. Um, it's called it's a picture book called The Strange Birds of Flannery O'Connor. Um, it's actually behind her. I don't know. If, um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> A great book it's really wonderful thank it's you great. and i will be sending out um there's a special discount code for everyone that's um, registered tonight for this event and it'll give you um 15 percent off um if you order it through enchanted lion books which is a, the publisher of the book um which is an amazing publisher outside of um, out of new york city and the code is flannery's birds but again i'll email that out um along with the dapple things code for 25 percent off as well um so yeah, I just want to sort of say thank you to all. Oh, sorry, yes, Jessica. One thing. Um, I know one of the other partners was Portsmouth Institute. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so if people are really interested in Flannery O'Connor and want to learn more, because of COVID, we had to delay this summer's Flannery O'Connor week at the Portsmouth Institute, but it's going to be 2021. So if you're interested in just spending a week learning how to teach Flannery O'Connor and more about Flannery O'Connor, that's at the Portsmouth Institute. So I hope you get to check it out. Awesome. Thank you. Um, and I'll be sending out, um, for any of you who are interested, actually all four of our um, guest panelists tonight are actually um, agreed graciously to be a part of Collegium's summer <laughs> seminar. Um, so we're actually going to be um, starting next week. I'll send info about this as well. Um, registration is still open uh, till Friday morning, so you have some time to register. It's not an application, but just a little Google form. Um, so we'll actually be reading The Violent Barrett Away, um, but we'll actually start the first week with um, an essay from Flannery and some of her letters with Christine. Um, so if you want to kind of dwell with Flannery a little bit longer this summer, um, we'll actually be having that as well. And again, I'll email you all about that. Um, so thank you so much for everyone who came. Uh, thank you to all of the speakers um, for all of the time and work you put, in, put into this. So um, I really appreciate it. And I think I'm sure everyone else does too. Thank you. Oh, yes. Thank you so much. That was fun. Everybody should go read Flannery. <laughs> Bye, y'all. Bye.